We continue with our readings this morning. Our first reading this morning is from Acts chapter 3. Here in Acts chapter 3, the apostle Peter uses God's power to heal a man who had been laden from birth. More importantly, however, than Christ Peter healing this man's physical malady was the joy it brought to this man, which was found in a restored relationship with God through faith in Jesus. We read. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold? I do not have, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he held him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man. We used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks be to God. We continue with our psalm today, Psalm 146, which is a psalm of praise that finds hope in God's power. Uh, this morning we will sing this psalm as it's expressed in our hymnal. So again, that's Psalm 146.
today from Mark chapter 7, Jesus uses his own power to heal another man from his physical ailment. Interestingly, however, Jesus doesn't want people to be focused on this powerful miracle itself, and that's because Jesus had something more important to bring to everyone, including this man. Out of love and respect for these words and works of our Savior Jesus, please stand for the reading of today's gospel. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Cairo and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly walk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephetha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We prepare to focus on God for further in our sermon today. We'll prepare our hearts for the hymn of the day, O Son of God in Galilee. It's in 765 of the following in hymnal, and we'll sing stanzas one through four. Thank you. 
Christ, you're sick. You're struggling to pay the bills. You are straining to repair a relationship. You feel like you're just, why doesn't God do what he did earlier in our readings and use his power to help you? Today as we continue our series, which is all about following God's leadership, I think we all agree, right, that Christ's leadership is the best. It's better than any other leader under whom we often change. But as we place our, our faith in Christ, as we love him, as we hope in him, why doesn't Christ use more of his power to help us right now, here in our lives? Well, today, God loves to answer that question for us through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived and wrote during a time where the people whom he ministered to, the tribe of Judah, they were surrounded on all sides by trouble. And yeah, they were experiencing a period of resurgence under a faithful king called Hezekiah. They would celebrate the Passover, for example, in a more glorious fashion than any other since the time of Solomon, hundreds of years earlier, before the kingdom had been divided. They even, speaking of their worst life, got rid of all the high priest places in the land of Judah, along with their worship of detestable gods like Baal and Asherah and Molech, gods who encouraged sick and sadistic practices, which involved things like sex and slavery and the, the sacrifice of their own children. I mean, they were doing really good. And yet, despite all of that, despite the fact that they were God's chosen people, their power still seemed so limited. I mean, not only were they divided between the northern and southern tribes, but the northern tribes had now been carried off into exile by the empire of Assyria. And then their king, Sennacherib, he threatened to do the same thing to Judah to carry them off to destroy the city of Jerusalem along with God's temple. It just would have felt like to them that they were never going to be able to regain the former glory of David's empire. In other words, our own analogy, which we'll hear in our sermon text, it felt to them like they were surrounded by wilderness, desert on all sides, and that this, this desert was encroaching in on them. And yet, in our sermon text today, God promises to offer his transformative power for the help of his people, for his Old Testament followers, and he, he promises it in a way that it means something for us New Testament followers also. And that's what God shares with us through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 35 of his prophecy, beginning with verse 1. And so we listen as God speaks also to us through Isaiah. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given with the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strength of the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstop. Then will the lame weep like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool of the thirsty crown, bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. The word of our Lord. Now as we think about those words right off the bat, one thing this sermon text is clearly about is about 
transformation. I mean, as we go back to verse 1, we're told the desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. If you've ever seen it, perhaps it conjures up for you images from the Arizona desert, which blooms once a year with those spring rains. Have. But as we think of the image described in our text, you begin to realize it's something more. Because what God is describing through Isaiah here is not just a season, but a true transformation, a more permanent thing. As Isaiah continues in verse 2, he says, The glory of Lebanon will be given to the desert. Lebanon was famous in the Mediterranean world for cedar trees, which grew on its slopes and sucked in the, the moisture that came off of the sea. You look at Lebanon today, in fact, their tree still has a, a cedar tree on it. So when you look at that, how, how did the desert support such magnificent trees? Likewise, we're told by Isaiah, the, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon will be given to the desert. Carmel and Sharon, those were to the north of Israel. They were coastal regions that were always green. Again, you just wouldn't expect that from a desert. Maybe for one small period out of the year, but it's not always going to be green. It's not always going to be lush. And yet, that's the transformation that Isaiah describes. And, and notice what he says causes it. He says, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. God is the one who brings that kind of transformative changing power. And that's what he offers to his followers as well. That's why he tells Isaiah in verse 3, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Sing to those with fearful hearts. Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will have a vengeance with divine retribution. He will come to save you. You see what God's promising here. It's, it's not just that he would use his power to remedy one situation or another in your life. Rather, just like God completely transformed the desert, so also he makes it clear to them that he wants to use his power to transform his followers themselves. As he says, he would save them, and that would even include bringing vengeance, justice for, for all who had wronged them. And notice how it's only after that that the other things that are wrong in their lives get fixed also. Verse 5, we're told, then, after that salvation, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Finally, it's the joy that comes because it is a total transformation. Just like we were told before, the desert rejoiced and was glad because of the total transformation that God brought to it in the first part of our reading. Speaking of which, that's where Isaiah ends. And he returns once more to this image of, of transformation. He just doesn't want his listener to lose sight of what God is promising to them, even in the desert of their lives. And now as we apply this to ourselves, that's really the big question for us. Do we lose sight of all of this. As we think about the imagery of the desert in our sermon text, it's true that our lives can sometimes feel like a desert, right? There are times in our lives where things just feel dry and barren. We are parched and needy. And so we wonder, right? Why hey, doesn't God use his power just to give us one cup of water? That's all I'm asking for, Lord. Or just to give us a, a small tree that can provide us with some shade or some shelter in the desert. The problem with those requests is that we are asking for something that will not last, that will not matter in the long run. Because you think about it, you get that cup of water, you drink it, when it's gone, you're still stuck in the desert. Then what? Or that tree, that may provide you with some temporary shelter, but it won't take long for a proper tree to wither and die in the desert, and then it's only going to provide you with a shadow of its former shelter. And how often is that how we look at it in our lives? We, we want God to use his power to just fix things. And maybe it's that he would provide us with physical healing, like Peter and Jesus did in our reading earlier. Maybe it's that he would use his power to give us more money, more possessions. After all, 
a world built on that kind of stuff. And it would just make things easier, Lord. I, I mean, we've got bills to pay, don't we? Or maybe it's something else that you can see. Why doesn't God use his power to give it to you? But the interesting thing is, often in love, God does give us many of these things. How often in our lives does God give us that cup of water? It's not going to last, but he loves us and he gives it to us. How often does he give us that nice shade tree that we can enjoy for a time? How often does God provide us with help and healing? Maybe not the way we want it, but truly in a way that we're grateful for. I mean, finally, how often does God give to us pretty much exactly what we want? And yet, do we still feel strong? Do we still feel content? Or is there still some anxiety? When God gives to us these things, do we just have this full, unbridled sense of joy? Or is our happiness still fleeting? You see, finally, often we just want God to use his power to transform things in our life, things in this world that really don't matter in the long run. We think they do, but how much can it really matter if you get what you want and then you're still lacking in the end, you're still unhappy. God wants us to have better than that, and that is why God uses his power to transform not just our circumstances in this world, not just our lives here on this earth, but he uses his power to transform our very selves, our very souls, as his followers. And that's why God maybe doesn't give to us that cup of water that we're looking for or that, that nice tree with some shade. But only so that he can use his power to transform the desert. If you see in the place where there's burning hot sand, God wants there to be reliable, constantly flowing a, a nice cool stream. Or in the place where there is just wind scoured sagebrush. Maybe we can relate to that here in the Dakotas. God wants there to be a lush forest that's just soaking up moisture off of the sea. You see, what God wants to bring to you and to me is something more whole, holistic, healing, and that's what we heard. That's why God comes to save us. Save us from what? He comes to provide vengeance, justice. Justice from whom? Simply what God comes to save us from our sins. Our sins which are always hurting us, which is causing this desert in the first place. He comes to provide vengeance for all the things that others have done wrong, the sins they have committed against us. Finally, God comes to deliver us from the barren wasteland of a fallen land. And doesn't that explain Jesus? Doesn't that explain everything about him? Just one example. Think of our gospel reading today. Isn't it interesting when Jesus didn't want that man to tell other people about how he healed him. But you think about it, that was for a really good reason. Because Jesus didn't want people so focused on the spectacle that they lost sight of who he was and what his power was all about. You see, finally, if people were just relying on Jesus to heal them, to give them food, to provide their earthly needs, all of that, and if he kept giving those things to them, they never would have allowed him to die. You get it? They got a good thing. They would have protected him at all costs. In fact, like that, I can explain why later on in Jesus' ministry, he was okay with his teachings driving people away. He didn't want to be that kind of savior because finally, if that's all Jesus was, he wouldn't have been able to die for us and take away our sins, which meant those earthly things are all he would have been able, would have been able to give to us. And that's good for now, but then what happens when we die and we still have that deep spiritual need? We still have our sin. What happens then when our sin begins to transform eternity into a second bare wasteland? The last thing God wanted. And so that's why in love, he uses his power to transform us, our souls, first and foremost. And because that involves sin, we all have sinful hearts, it's, it's hard work. Jesus' death on the cross was hard work. In fact, even though our salvation is absolutely 100% certain in Jesus, who did all the work for us, it is still, in a sense, an ongoing process. And I, I say that only because the Bible tells us the last enemy to 
be destroyed is death. So you think about that, it's not until the resurrection of our own body someday, through faith in Jesus, that God will work this complete transformation in heaven, where we are free of all the consequences of sin and death. Again, that's what God focuses on first and foremost. A more permanent solution. He transforms the desert. And yet, with that being said, isn't it true that in love, secondarily, God still gives us many other things as well? Because he does transform things in our lives, too. He does use his power to give us so much of health and family and so many other good things. And finally, you think about that. Why does he do it? Well, not only does he love us, and so he showers his blessings upon us, but he wants to give us a taste. A taste of something more. A taste of these perfect blessings he's going to give to us in eternity. And as he gives us that taste, it can provide a picture for us of that complete transformation that he wants to bring to us. That is what God intends to bring to us. Uh, bring joy to us with. If you think about that, that was, that was pictured in our sermon text in a memorable way. In our sermon text was that deer leaping up for joy. If any of you have ever been out hunting and you suddenly swoop the deer, you know how high they can jump. You know what a powerful image that is. Or just take the image from our, our epistle reading, right? Peter heals this man who's lame. His feet are suddenly working. His legs, he's literally jumping up and down in the temple courts in front of others. He has no shame. He just can't contain his excitement, his joy. For me, I've got to add one more. I think of those images. I can't help but think of my littlest one, Daniel. When he is excited about something, when Daniel is joyful in his heart, he will literally bounce from one place to the next. He, he just can't keep it in. Because that's what joy does, right? If you think of all those images, that's the picture God is painting for us today. That's that's what he wants for all of us as his followers, a joy in our hearts that is so powerful it's just weak. We can't keep it in. On the other hand, if we don't have that joy, might that be a sign that we're missing something, that we're still lacking in some way? Might that even explain why God doesn't use his power to give us all the things we want in this life? May God choose not to transform the circumstances in our life because he knows that we are the cause of them and we'll just cause them again if nothing else changes. May God not transform the circumstances in our life because he knows we are not yet ready to enjoy this blessing. I mean, we've all seen that, right? We've seen people who have it all in this world, but their faith isn't in a good place. They've got some other problem they're, they're working through, and so they can't enjoy what God has given to them. But that's his follower in love. God doesn't want that to be you. So God focuses on fixing you first. He focuses on fixing my heart first, also that we can be free to enjoy all the other things that come from his hands. You know, in the end, it's, it's always going to be tempting to think we just need more power. We just need more power at work in our lives, and that will fix all of our problems. But the thing about power is it's truly a neutral thing. It can be good or it can be bad. Take fire as an example. Fire is very powerful. And that can be a really good thing if you need heat on a cold night. It can also be a really bad thing if your house is burning down on a cold night. Or how about nuclear fission? That's powerful. And it can be a really good thing, right? If it's powering an entire city, billions of people. Are benefiting from it. On the other hand, it could be a really bad thing if its power is harnessed to destroy an entire city. Likewise, we may think that God's power is only a good thing and we just need more of it in our lives, more of it acting in our lives, it will fix everything. But God knows his power needs to be used for the right reasons. Because finally, if God's power is only used to transform the circumstances in our lives, it can actually become a destructive thing that would stand in the way of the life he wants to give to us, the life to come. But on the other hand, if God's power is used to transform our very hearts, our very souls, which will endure forever, it becomes a constructive thing that frees us to enjoy not only the blessings in this life, but especially the blessings in the life to come. And when we have that, that's what we're going to find. If I can borrow an image once more from our sermon text. That's what we're going to find. We no longer need that cup of water. Sure, we're 
thirsty, but we're no longer in the desert. God has transformed that around us. There is water everywhere. If I don't have that cup of water, it's okay. God's going to meet my need in some other way. In fact, he does so in many other ways. Especially through Jesus our Savior, through whom he gives to us all things. Amen. Please stand. Now may this peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life which is everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with our confession of faith. Uh, this morning we'll use the confession of faith that we find in the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he became down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and became the Holy Human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated, and we will continue both with our offerings and the children's sermons by invite the young kids of the congregation to come up. That's right. And 
You know, I think sometimes we just wish God would use his power to fix everything, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. yeah. Well, then that's, that's the issue, right? There's sin, right? Because sometimes we wish God would just use his power, right, to maybe give us money, to give us good things, to heal us, to take away our sicknesses. What else do you sometimes wish God might use his power for, Elijah? But he uses all the things he wants and he will bless us. There you go, right? He, so even if he gave us all those things here on this earth, will we still die? Yeah. And will we still need to be saved from our sin? Yeah. Yeah, so you mean... You begin to see how God's power, it's a good thing, but it doesn't always fix everything in our lives. And you think that's maybe why God doesn't give to us all these things? Yeah. What were you going to say, Lexi? Um, to, like, hope for get a straight CD because she's tired of the curve. Oh, God uses power maybe to get your mom a better sewing machine or something? Okay. So, yeah, he could use his power to, to fix that, right? And make it better, right? Yeah? I guess we've given them both a chance. How about Daniel? What else do you wish God would use his power to fix? And to fix sin. And that's, that's the most important thing. Is even if God doesn't use his power to give us these other things, does he use his power to fix sin? Yes, but he goes back into us and he gets rid of it every time. He gets rid of it every time. How did God use all of his power to fix sin? Jesus died on the cross. That's how he fixed the most important thing. Sin. So even if he doesn't use his power to give us everything, he uses his power to give us forgiveness and to take away our sins, right? So that there's nothing in between us and God. <clears throat> That's why we like to talk sometimes about the power of the cross. Does that sound like a hand you guys sang a few years ago? Yeah, this got the cross is really the most powerful thing. That's where God chooses to use all his power. And let me ask you, is that a good way for power to be used? Yeah, yeah just like a fire cooking. Marshmallows are just like the electricity heating your home and, and turning all the lights on. You're right, because God chooses not to use his power in a bad way. Now, if he gave us all we wanted in this world, that would be a bad thing. But has God ever going to do a bad thing? No, you're right. He only uses his power in good ways. So, if he's not using his power to help us with something, it must be because it would be a bad use of his power, right? Because God knows these things, right? So, yeah. Pretty cool, huh? You think all that God's always going to use his power for the things we need. Let's pray about that, all right? We'll hold our hands and bow our heads and we pray. Dear Jesus, you are our powerful God. Thank you for humbling yourself and using your power to save us from sin and death by dying to yourself. Teach us always to see the real purpose of your power. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Let's say it together. Amen. All right, thank you guys so much for coming up. We continue with the service of morning prayer on page. 210 of your angle, and we'll continue with the TDM of God. So we praise you, O oh God.
Psalm 73, God says this. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's a great summary of what we talked about today. Our strength is not found in what we often think it's found in. It's not found in physical things. It's not found in the things of this world and the things around us or in what we have or don't have. It's found in the Lord. As long as we have that strength of the heart, we will not fail. Before we get to our announcements, uh, we will have the Wells Connection. It's actually from last month. So we'll catch up with what's going on in our synod. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Our synod's effort to plant 100 new mission churches and enhance 75 existing ministries in 10 years continues to be moving strong by the grace of God. And as the effort moves forward, our current mission churches continue to bring light into the darkness. Most of his life, Ron Burma thought there was no hope for him. From a very young age, I was consumed by the darkness and the curse that surrounds Detroit. Crime, death, and drugs were just part of my everyday life. I didn't think I was going to go anywhere. I never thought I was going to make it out. And it was, it was wild how quickly I was consumed by everything. A few years ago, he knew a major change was needed. So he made a move to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I moved in with my sister and she kind of let me be sick on the couch for a couple of weeks. And uh, then after that happened, I started moving around the house and getting out in the neighborhood. And without Rob knowing it, a seemingly chance encounter with his new Tennessee neighbor, Terry, would be exactly what he needed. And I talked to him for probably about an hour for the first time meeting him. And uh, he, he described to me the, the fellowship and the camaraderie at this church here. And it really enticed me and made me, made me think I wanted more out of my life and that it, redemption was possible. Through Terry's simple invitation to visit his church, Rob checked out Living Hope, a Wells Home Mission Church in Chattanooga. I walked in with my daughter and I was nervous and very quickly I was greeted and I was welcomed into the church. My daughter was greeted, and I knew I belonged. It felt like something I hadn't felt in years. Living Hope Lutheran Church has been sharing the hope of Christ with their community since 2017. Since then, God has been blessing them with growth in their congregation and a building of their own, which they moved into in 2021. You want it to be a place where you come and get filled up with hope for every day. It's on our t-shirts, it's kind of the tagline for our church. We just want hope to just be shining off from this place, to know that we have hope in Christ, hope for eternal life, but it's also that, that hope that we have to get through every single day and the challenges and uh, the hard things that you have to go through, that Christ is there with you. Mark chapter 8, for the first time here, Jesus is speaking very plainly, very openly to his disciples about this day. Help me find purpose. Just in that first time coming here, I felt so much weight on my shoulders. I felt the burdens of the world were unbearable. And just this little bit of this hour helped me find peace that I haven't found in years. Rob kept coming back to me, and soon began to study the scriptures deeper with Pastor Melsa. Through their foundations class, Rob learned about the peace and hope only found in Jesus. No matter how lost or broken or the wrongs you feel you may have committed, Jesus is the way back. Jesus is the way to salvation, to lightening the load that's on your shoulders. As special as Rob's story is, 
his story is like so many others too. Just people that hit those low points in life and he's searching for answers. And we can be the people um, here at Living Hope or one of any of our churches across the country that's there to offer the hope that we have. Well, as well mission churches across the nation and are intentionally preparing to connect with lost souls like Rob and share God's message of hope for the hopeless. We don't want this new building, this new church, now that we have a facility to become a fortress. We like talking about a mighty fortress as Lutherans, but it's not just a fortress. We've got a place to regroup and get equipped, but now this is our, our launching pad to go and reach more people in our community with the love of Christ. Something's different inside of me. I'm ready. I'm ready for the next chapter in my life. You can follow and support this effort by visiting wells110.net. There you'll be able to see the progress of planting and enhancing churches, as well as see more stories of real people like Rob being connected to Jesus in wonderful ways.
great to worship with you today. God bless you for coming to me. See you on the way out.